Hi, I'm Morgan McGuire from Williams College in NVIDIA Research, and today I'm pre presenting Phenomenological Transparency, which is research that I did with Mike Mara of Stanford and NVIDIA Research. This is a new technique for real-time transparency that for the first time captures many of the different effects of transparency in an order-independent way, which allows for efficient GPU utilization. Here's an overview of the basic features of the approach, and you can read all of the details beyond this presentation on our website, which is listed on the last slide. So here are the kinds of effects that we see from transparency. And there are three local blending effects, which are cases where different surfaces at the same pixel overlap, and they need to be blended together to create the final image. So one is emission, which is often referred to as additive blending. And in this case, there's a transparent medium that itself is emitting light and glowing. There's partial coverage, which is cases like this window screen, and also edge anti-aliasing, where a polygon cuts through the middle of a pixel, uh, and the case of really thin surfaces, so for example, a telephone wire. And then, of course, there's transmission for things like glass or clear plastic, where that has a full color associated with it. And surfaces that transmit light often reflect light as well. In addition to these three local effects, there are three non-local effects where different pixels on the screen affect each other. So refraction happens where there's a change in index of refraction at an optical interface, and where if the surface is curved, we get light rays focusing. Caustics and shadows happen when light comes from a source through a transmissive medium and then is tinted, and if there's an index of refraction change there, we get the light focusing. So like when you have a magnifying glass and you're lighting up an ant. In diffusion, where light passes through a multiple scattering medium and essentially takes a random walk and comes out diffused, like a shower, frosted shower glass. So what's interesting about all these effects is that as reported in both the computer graphics and the perceptual literature, humans don't really perceive the radiometric qualities. Instead, what we perceive are overall phenomena, which are mostly driven um, by the geometry of what we're seeing and by the frequency content. So for example, in the case with this uh, reflect, refracting sphere, you're perceiving this as a glass sphere because of the shape of the distortion matches the overall shape of the surface and because there's high frequency sharp content. And that's exactly the perception I wanted you to have when I faked this image in Photoshop. So all of these referenced photographs I've shown are actually fake. And in this case, you can see the real image on the left and on the right is something I've drawn. And I did this for the caustic images and the other ones as well. And what this tells us is that for many of the transparency phenomena, if we get the frequency content right, we can make large approximations in places that will maybe increase performance, but won't hurt the overall perception of the image. Before I tell you about that, let's talk about the state of the art and transparency right now for real-time applications. And the primary state of the art is to design your application to simply avoid using transparency at all. There are also methods like sorted transparency, or the painter's algorithm, where we try to draw surfaces in from back to front, and then various other methods that have uh, come about in the literature and are starting to be used today. And all of these have certain kinds of problems where they either affect resolution or GPU performance, because they can cause pipeline stall. What's just around the corner and starting to be used are order-independent methods. These methods have the advantage that you can submit a single monolithic draw call. You don't have to order surfaces, and you don't have to worry about interpenetration. And there's a family of k-buffer methods, all of which uh, build essentially a, a small linked list in memory, and then perform some sort of sorting per pixel, and the weighted blended methods, which essentially are k-buffers with a single layer, and so they collapse everything. And what's new in this work is the phenomenological transparency has a robust weighting scheme that makes it better than previous weighted blended methods, and it captures many, many more phenomena than all these methods have handled before. That was general transparency. For specific one-off effects, there are a number of methods, and these often get very high quality, and in some cases also high performance, but they don't tend to interact well with other methods. And so our contribution will be accelerating these, but also bringing them all into a single order-independent framework. So for example, there are many good diffusion methods we're going to follow up on those ideas and use those algorithms, bring them to real time and make them order independent, and also take things like screen space refraction, but we're going to allow the screen space refraction 
to be order independent as well. So you can submit the layers in any order, track the refraction, and then apply it at the end in a resolve path. There are also many fast and high quality caustic methods for specific conditions such as a flat receiver or maybe one or two surfaces and transparent shadow methods. What's interesting about the transparent shadow methods is we found that the sort of complementary properties of two of the main uh, areas of research. So one is stochastic shadow maps give high quality, but they're noisy and they require an expensive filtering step. And variant shadow maps uh, avoid the expensive filtering step, but they have light leaks. And by combining the two methods together, we can get the performance and the quality. We still have a few light leaks, but they only occur inside of transparent surfaces. So here's an overview of our method. First, we generate shadow maps. Opaque surfaces go through a regular shadow map production pass at regular resolution. And then we route the transparent surfaces through a stochastic shadow map pass. This is essentially McGuire and Enderton's colored stochastic shadow map algorithm. What we do, though, is within that method, in order to create caustics, we apply Snell's law and the BSDF and Fresnel terms in order to compute surfaces that are at uh, normal incidence will allow light to mostly pass through and light will get focused there because it's moving away from surfaces that are seen at glancing angles. This produces a very high resolution colored stochastic shadow map. That would be too expensive to sample in real time. So we then take a 15 by 15 separable tent filter, blur that down and we create uh, a Donnelly and Loritzen style mean invariant shadow map. And that has two channels. There's the colored means, and then there's the colored variances as well. And that's down at the regular resolution of the surface. Then for the actual shading. So opaque surfaces go through a regular either forward plus or G buffer shading pass. And they produce uh, an output image, but also normals and depth values. Then we route the transparent pass, the transparent surfaces into two different ways. Low resolution surfaces, such as particles, where there might be a lot of them we need to process quickly, can run at quarter resolution or lower. And they go into an order dependent frame buffer. And then we also have the full resolution surfaces like glass that need to be rendered at full resolution. And those will go into a separate frame buffer. Those frame buffers for the order independence are storing multiple channels that I'll get to in a minute. We then take the uh, opaque frame buffer. We're going to downsample the normals and depth and use those as input for a bilateral upsampler to resolve everything into the full res frame buffer and then we'll composite that into the final image. Here's what's in that order independent frame buffer. It has three render targets. The first render target is storing additive terms, so emission and reflection, as well as a normalizing constant of the accumulated weighting. The second buffer is essentially storing an alpha channel for the background. It's the multiplicative value saying how much of the background will get transmitted. We store the variance of the diffusion point spread function. So this is when we have something like that frosted glass. There's a naturally occurring Gaussian spread of the light as it goes through in the point spread function. We store the variance because that's going to combine linearly. And then for refraction, we're storing the pixel delta that uh, each surface is offsetting values by. We can compress those into 112 bits total. And so that's a relatively small buffer. And if we didn't care about all the other effects, we just wanted alpha only, like previous order independent transparency methods, we can get that down to 88 bits per pixel. I mentioned earlier there's a new weighting function. That's, this is what makes uh, phenomenological transparency more robust than previous blended uh, weighted transparency methods. I'm not going to go into this in detail, but here are sort of the major elements that affect the contribution of each surface. So it's going to fall off with depth, glfragcord.c, with partial coverage, and with the mean amount of transmission that's going through the surface. So let's take a look at some results. Here are the run times in milliseconds. We're seeing a number of different kinds of scenes here. The ones in purple we've identified as CAD-like. So these are cases where every single surface is going to be rendered at high resolution and has transparency, either for thin lines or lots of glass. And then we have game-like scenes where maybe we can take particle systems that are covering a lot and there's glass, but there's also a lot of opaque surfaces. And in addition, for this method, 
We're doing uh, foliage anti-aliasing as well. So when we see a lot of leaves in the San Miguel scene, uh, all the edge pixels on each of the leaves are going to have alpha on them and get composited. And in general, our run times are, uh, this is at 1080p on a GeForce 980. And we're down at a few milliseconds range for all of the transparent rendering and the resolve. The one very expensive scene is this hair scene that has, uh, it's a research scene with 24 million uh, separate hairs. And that takes a lot of GPU time just to submit the work. And so the OIT pass ends up taking a disproportional amount of time. So here's an example of simple case of transmission. We're seeing three colored water bottles. Remember these are submitted in arbitrary order. And the key effect that you can see here is the ordering is obvious. So it's clear that the farthest back is that gray bottle, then there's the blue bottle, and then the green bottle in front of it. You can see on the left-hand side of the image the visualization of those three channels. So the additive light that's coming off, uh, the amount, the normalizing constant, and at the bottom the beta of how much light is transmitted through from the background. And for a transmissive surface that's glass or plastic, that's primarily going to be the quote unquote color of the surfaces. So that's an easy case. Here's a more complicated surface. This is a CAD-like scene. So here we have the same car engine block and it's being shown at two different orientations, also with the transmissive shadows on the bottom. And you can clearly see in the different orientations, even though there are hundreds of overlapping surfaces all with partial coverage, that this sort of big purple uh, rectangle block is clearly in front in one image and then behind in the other. We can do refraction and caustic. First we have three different indices of refraction for the same shape. So a plastic sphere, a glass sphere, and a diamond sphere. And then we have a diamond cow to show same index of refraction, different shape. So on the top image, you can clearly see the refraction of the background, and that's increasing with the index of refraction, the amount of distortion of those orange lines. But if you look at the shadows, you'll see not only are they transparent, but as the index of refraction increases, we end up focusing the light down. On the bottom here, we have a visualization of the stochastic shadow map before we computed variance from it. This is cropped down to just a section that corresponds to what's visible in the image above. The actual shadow map is much larger. And the key idea is that there's all this noise from the variance in the stochastic shadowing, and that's gonna get blurred out when we put it into the um, variant shadow map representation. But you can also see how the light is getting focused at the center towards normal incidence, even on a complicated shape such as the cow. Here's a case where we have, like the frosted shower glass, heavy diffusion. There's a private investigator's door, it's frosted glass. There's a character in silhouette standing close behind it, and then one standing farther away in the distance. And there's also stenciling on top of the, the door itself. And the key idea is that we see in the diffusion map, we can see that the farther away character is blurred more and that none of the lettering is blurred at all, so both of which are cor correct. And I can see this even more clearly when I animate the scene and I'll see that as I move that first character wearing the hat farther into the scene, the amount of blurring changes. So when he's close, he's sharply in focus and as he moves far away, he gets blurred more. Here's another more complicated scene in this case, we have thousands of particles. Each one is diffusing as well as having partial coverage. You can see in the accumulated diffusion map, the farther you get back down this street, the more blurring there is. So this is an effect that happens in the real world. It's why things seem slightly out of focus when they're in the distance on a hazy day or in heavy fog. For an actual game, you may want to turn off the diffusion for performance, but here we can show this sort of high quality result as things are getting not just occluded, but diffused into the distance. It's a more complicated case. It's a glass chess set. So all of the clear and red pieces are creating refraction. They're also creating caustics, and they're of course transmitting light. You can see in this case, much more complicated values in the order independent frame buffer, including now some interesting diffraction values. And in this case, uh, the refraction has been coded so that green is horizontal displacement and red is vertical. And so where it goes yellow, that's both are being displaced. And here's an example of our mixed resolution. So on the left side of the image, we're showing the full resolution. And on the right side of the image, the opaque surfaces like the car itself have been computed at full resolution and the glass is full resolution. 
but all of the smoke and dust in the air is being computed at quarter resolution in each dimension. And the key idea here is that you can see that in, even in the subsampled uh, smoke, we're getting a really sharp pixel perfect cutout around that wheel well. And there's a little bit of loss of contrast in terms of some of the fine detail has been lost. But that actually is a feature in this case because it's also getting rid of some of the stochastic noise from the alpha channel and texture compression. Here's another complicated result. This goes with the noir scenes. Here we have many, many layers of refracting surfaces, all submitted in any order. We're also getting the colored shadows and we're getting the caustics off of those ice cubes and the complicated shape of the glass. Here we are in the San Miguel scene. All of the foliage has uh, partial coverage on it. We also have transmission from all of the glass. And you can see they're overlapping correctly in any order. Here's another shot from inside of San Miguel. Again, you can see in that uh, middle visualization all of the many different little bits of alpha coming off of the foliage as well as the various glass from the windows and the table center. And finally, I'm going to say one of the most interesting results we had and sort of part of the motivation for getting good transparency is that when you do virtual reality rendering, especially for a head-mounted display, there's this problem of you have an increased depth awareness because you have stereo vision, but the accommodation of the eyes doesn't match the virgins. And so we're always focusing about a meter away from ourselves on this flat surface, even though the disparity is telling us that surfaces are at different depths. And uh, that discontinuity is one of the things that causes for many people uh, stress or nausea when they're inside of a virtual reality system. And an interesting thing that we found was that in addition to transparency itself being an incredibly important depth cue, so as we layer levels of glass and smoke, we, we get a strong sense of depth of surfaces and we get volumetric lighting as well. We found that just the disparity was really key and that it sort of restores a sense of focus. And the idea is if we look in this image, you can see where I'm pointing with that yellow arrow, there's a red chest night in the background and a clear chest night in the foreground. But due to parallax, they overlap at different pixels for the different eyes. So in one case, the red chest night in the distance is occluded and in the other one, it's clearly visible. And what that does, which never happens with opaque surfaces in virtual reality, is it gives two different places that your eyes can converge. So you can choose to focus on the background and have your eyes converge on that red chest night or focus on the foreground and have them converge on the clear chest night. And that ability to sort of choose feels like you're truly focusing. It's not a true focus because you're just changing the angle that your eyes are pointing, not the actual curvature of your lens. But it restores a lot of that lost depth cue. So we're very excited about this effect and the potential for things like volumetric shadows with this approach. So we think it's an important way of moving a new depth cue into virtual reality. So thank you very much. And I'd like to acknowledge the many people who contributed either to the paper or to this recording.